I don't even want to do this one. Hey everyone and welcome back to Joey's Retro Handhelds. I'm Joey and today we're going to be doing a deep dive review into the Retroid Pocket 3 Plus Metal Edition. I get asked a lot and I see it a lot, which one should I buy? The Retroid Pocket 3 Plus or the Ambernic RG405M? And the reason why is they're both running the same chipset. So theoretically they should have the same performance as well. So it only makes sense to compare the two, and especially when they're in such similar price points. I figure this is the best time to do that. And so instead of me running out of breath every time I want to talk about the Retroid Pocket 3 Plus Metal Edition, we're just going to call it the Retroid. Make it easy, make it simple on me especially, and we'll go through the video that way. Neither of these devices were sent to me for review. I paid with my own money for both of them. And so unlike the mini battle Game Boy video that I did of the Miu Mini Plus versus the Ambernic RG35XX, this one actually has a clear winner. That one I didn't really have one, but in this video, if you can probably tell from my opening, there is one better device in my opinion. The Retroid only has one single color for metal, and it's this really cool gradient blue that you can see here which is awesome, I love it. I've been looking forward to seeing this in person since I actually saw it online and it hasn't disappointed. It's really awesome to see in person and I think it's one of the best designs out there right now for a colored handheld. The 405M on the other hand has two different color options. There's a black version and then the gray version that we have here with the Skittle colored buttons. That's mainly the difference between the two. I really like the colored buttons, that's the reason I went with this option instead of the black. I would love it if the Retroid had colored buttons like this, I think it would look awesome with the gradient color, but unfortunately we don't have that. Making sense of the specs, both devices are using the same chipset and therefore have basically the same performance. The general idea is they will do great for Nintendo 64, PlayStation 1, Dreamcast, and below. PSP is also great on both, but it's better on the Retroid given the screen size and aspect ratio. And they'll both do PlayStation 2, GameCube, Wii, and some Switch Indies as well, with the Retroid being able to do Vita. Now, those consoles are considered bonus consoles in my mind. They're not going to have the full compatibility for all of them, so just keep that in mind. It's a very wide range, and you'll see later what that actually translates to for playability. On paper, they basically have the exact same specs, minus two very big important differences, and that's the screen and HDMI out. The Retroid has a much better and larger 4.7 inch 750 by 1334 screen, and the 405M has a 640 by 480 screen. This will come into play for what platforms have the black bars on the sides as we stick to the native aspect ratio for most consoles. The Retroid also has the ability for HDMI out through its mini HDMI port, where the 405M doesn't have that option at all. This might be a deal breaker for some of you already that like to play on your TV. The Retroid weighs 285 grams, which is 25 grams more than the 405M, but since it's wider and slimmer, I didn't notice the difference at all, and I actually prefer the Retroid's weight distribution to the 405M. Retroid also has upgraded hall sticks for this release, and that matches the 405M. Meaning that for both of them, there's low to zero chance of stick drift on these devices. Lastly, the Retroid has stacked trigger buttons, so more in line with normal controllers, while the 405M has them in line, or side by side. In US dollars, they're both the same price at $179, or if you want to be a stickler, the 405M is a dollar cheaper. The 405M also includes a screen protector, while for some reason the Retroid doesn't. Even the budget handhelds include screen protectors, so I'm not exactly sure why they couldn't just put one in the box, besides wanting more money from selling it separately. I'll leave links in the description to both devices if you want them, but from a price perspective, no difference and in my personal opinion, I think both are fairly priced for what they offer. It's worth mentioning the Retroid has a non-metal version that's $30 cheaper 
with the exact same specifications minus the hall sticks. Some might say the non-metal version is better anyway. I'm part of that group, I think. For those wondering, both took basically the same amount of time to deliver to me, and that's about two weeks to Canada. Alright, let's just get into it, and if you're a Retroid fan, you're about to hate me. I hate this design. All of it. The entire thing. It's nonsensical. No holding back here, but they tried to match Ambernick's build quality and handheld design with this metal variant without putting any effort or thought into it. This metal version shouldn't exist, and if I could get a refund, I would. But I'm not sure I'd personally buy the non-metal version either, as my issues extend past the metal portion. For my metal-related gripes, the speaker cutouts on the bottom of the device are just sharp. There's no other way to put it, but it just scratches the hell out of my fingers with how I sometimes hold the device. My pinky, ring, middle, finger, it, it doesn't matter, it's scratching them all. And since it has no grip at all anywhere, if I don't hold it this way, it just slips and slides. There's just no comfortable way to hold this device for longer periods of time. The actual metal and everything feels great and fine, there's no issues there but it's like zero thought went into the rest beyond it. They basically said, just make a metal case and ship it. Meanwhile, Ambernick had the foresight to use grips and made sure nothing on the device is trying to cut me. You could absolutely use a grip to alleviate some of these issues, but that defeats the whole purpose of the color as well as the form factor. There is absolutely zero comparison here. From an ergonomics and comfort perspective, the 405M is better in every way and it doesn't stop there. I really really don't get the button placement or the actual buttons used on the Retroid. Here's a bunch of gaming devices, can you tell me what they all have in common? Yeah, you guessed it, they have the start and select buttons on the front and easily accessible. And if there's a home or menu button, it's also on the front. Lastly, the volume rockers are either on the top for horizontal handhelds or on the side for vertical. Never where you hold it. Now, for whatever reason, Retro decided, no, we're not going to do that. We're going to put the buttons in the most backwards way possible. Want your home button? I don't know, it's on the right. Volume buttons? What's convenience? Let's just put it on the left. Start and select? Try and guess. I don't know, let's put it up top. The amount of times I've tried to raise and lower the volume of the device and ended up pushing start and select is way too damn high. None of this makes sense. You have a larger surface area to work with than the 405M, and yet Ambernick still found a way to put all of these buttons in the right place and you couldn't. It's made that much more confusing when you see the Retroid's face buttons and you're left wondering if you can get these buttons in men's, not boys. Is this metal death trap for my baby cousin, or is it for me? I went on vacation right after getting this, so I brought it with me and handed it to my family and friends and asked their thoughts. I was super curious if they had the same thoughts that I did. Now, mind you, these are people not in this space, but are gamers and have or had Vitas, PSP, Switch, Game Boy, whatever it is, you name it. Every single person had the same thoughts I did. Why is the volume buttons on the left? Why is start and select on top? Why is it so uncomfortable and slipping out of my hands? Why is there a sharp metal part? And if I sound angry, it's because I am. I mentioned it before, but this was not sent for review. And so it was $250 Canadian out of my own pocket for a device that since the moment I got it, I've been trying hard to justify why it exists. And after pushing myself to use this for about two weeks now, it just shouldn't. Let's not forget, I was super excited for this. Not only because of the color, which is awesome, but because for months I've been hearing about how great the Retroid Pocket 3 Plus is. I actually had the non-metal one on order months ago that I cancelled and went with the 405M instead and after seeing this, I made the right decision. This channel might not even have existed if I had bought that instead. 
And so calming down a bit here, but the reason I'm angry or disappointed here is that if you remove the shell, buttons, and exterior from the equation, the actual software, screen, and games, and all of that is fantastic. I would absolutely love this device, but that's unfortunately not what we have here. So it's not all bad. This is only the start of the review, and as much as I'd love to just stop it here, let's continue, as there is some good here. You're likely curious if this gets hot, and I put it through a lot of torture with moving files, playing games, downloads, and more at the same time, and didn't find it getting hot at all. It got warm, which is normal, but nothing crazy hot. The 405M I found to get a lot hotter, which might be because of the compactness of the design and less the spread around. The Retroid's D-pad is also one that I like quite a bit and definitely prefer over the 405Ms. I'm a big fan of loose D-pads like this, it's not stiff in any way and super comfortable to move around. I didn't find any issues in my usual Pokemon test for false diagonals. The character would just continue in the correct direction no matter which way I tried to get the D-pad to go. For my personal preference and use case, I much prefer the D-pad on the bottom and would have preferred that but it's a tiny nitpick, and it's always personal preference for that choice anyway. Every button on the Retroid is clicky and loud. There's no silence here. So don't bring it to bed and expect not to wake up your partner. The 405M is the same in this way, so they're both not great. The Retroid's buttons, as I alluded to before, were just made for ants, as they're much smaller than your regular face buttons, and I found myself getting annoyed frequently at just how small they are. I'm guessing they were aiming for a specific size form factor, and so they needed to make concessions somewhere. But you don't make concessions on face buttons for a gaming handheld. You just don't. Like most companies nowadays, they just seem to be emulating what the Nintendo Switch did, but not everybody liked how those were laid out, or the size of those buttons. That's not why we bought the Switch. The screen on the Retroid is hands down the best thing about it. There's no sugarcoating it here. It's a beautiful screen and I enjoyed it quite a bit while playing with it. It's a much higher resolution than the 405M, allowing for some nice upscaling for some platforms. And it just made Android as a whole and the entire experience a lot better. Checking the brightness between both and the 405M gets a lot more dim compared to the Retroid but both are similar for max brightness. Checking outside on a sunny day and it's definitely playable. Just a ton of glare as usual. Audio on both is pretty good for speakers being at the bottom. Nothing to write home about, but no concerns for audio here. This is a fun one, as I can now compare the 405M's awesome custom firmware, Gamma OS, to Retroid's Android build. Gamma has done some awesome things to his 405M build. It's based on Lineage OS, he's added L2 R2 support for Android native games, and he's even using Retroid's GPU drivers for a performance boost. There's some other minor changes as well, but those are the big ones. But I have to say, Retroid software build is really, really good out of the box. And the included key mapper, which isn't in Gamma OS right now, is extremely helpful as well. Android is basically Android otherwise, and so there isn't much difference after that. You load into it long enough to set up Digisho as your front end, and you never see anything else besides games anyway. If we were comparing Ambernix stock Android to Retroid's, there's no contest. Retroid is better in every way. I didn't talk about it in the build quality section, but Retroid chose not to put metal over the Wi-Fi antenna to avoid any issues with range or signal. So they put some thought into that part at least. And in practice, testing both devices out for Wi-Fi signal, range and speed, 
I found the Retroid was quite a bit better, although for devices like this, both speeds are more than you need. For battery life, Gamma OS on the 405M is on a whole other level. And you can see it gets up to 20 hours on a charge that's been tested by both Gamma and Retro Tech Dad, which is just insane. Retroid is a lot closer to about 6 to 8 hours depending on the platform. So seriously, just check out Gamma's YouTube or Retro Tech Dad for the battery test they've done. It's big difference. As usual, let's talk about the use cases for this device and where I could see myself using it, if I actually liked it, or where I think it excels. For the 8 and 16-bit era, they'll play perfect and great, as usual. Aspect ratio being a bit better on the 405M for them, than the wide Retroid, although the nice screen on the Retroid counters that a bit. Game Boy Advance especially looks fantastic and is one of the two platforms I'd say you'd buy this device for, the other being PSP. I'm a huge fan of both Game Boy Advance and PSP on this device. Moving into 3D, and this is now where you can get some perfect emulation for Nintendo 64, PlayStation 1, and Dreamcast. They're all going to play extremely well and with upscaling. And while the 405M is a bit better here thanks to the aspect ratio of the screen, as long as you're not bothered by the bars, the Retroid is just as good and better with the great screen on it. Continuing to PSP, and thanks to the aspect ratio, this is one of the best ways to experience PSP outside of original hardware. Not only will the games use the entire screen, but you can play them nicely upscaled, and with how great this screen is, it's a fantastic experience. PSP would be one of the main platforms that I'd say you'd buy this device for, as well as everything up to this point so far. Now, let's get into the usual bonus consoles that require a ton of tweaks and concessions to get most of their library playable. I'll link a community spreadsheet in the description with games and best settings for them to help you out. I'm not going to go super in depth here as this device and chipset have been out forever. So you can find a ton of videos on these upcoming platforms and how games run. PlayStation 2, as usual, is a different beast for emulating. It's not a great experience as a whole on either device and a lot of games just aren't going to run well. You'll need a ton of tweaks in most cases just to get something good. My usual test is Simpsons Hit and Run, as you've seen. But if you see Need for Speed Most Wanted, it's almost a slideshow. And this is an even gameplay. It gives you an idea of the spread. This will all depend on what your level of comfort is for emulation in general. If you want a no-tweak scenario and everything just runs, this isn't for you. But if you're okay with substandard performance in most games, but somewhat playable, you can do that here. GameCube and Wii, however, are a bit of a different story. There's actually a good portion of games that you can play at full speed without worry. 
Super Smash Bros. Melee runs super well, for example. Same with Mario Kart Wii. Honestly, there's tons of videos on this chip and even this device, the non-metal version of it at least, so you can pull it up on YouTube and just see a list of all these games and how well they run. It'll do much better than anything I can show here. You can play some Nintendo Switch games on this device, and it's mostly indies right now like Cadence of Hyrule for example, or the usual Celeste. The Yuzu emulator for Android is progressing, so it might do more in the future. I'm using Skyline Edge for this video. This goes for the Vita as well. Although Persona just kept glitching for me, I'm sure there's a way to fix it, I just couldn't be bothered. I don't imagine many people are buying this device looking for completely playable Switch or Vita games, but if you are, this isn't it. Lastly, let's take a look at cloud streaming to end off the showcase. For xCloud, PS Play, and Moonlight, it's basically the same. It'll depend on how good your Wi-Fi is and connection, but otherwise they all work just fine. You can see here that I have a pretty good connection and that's because my house is wired with access points. Screen is a bit small to have a super great experience, but for some games you're definitely going to have a good time here. Nothing really new here to discuss, it really just depends on your network, but the Wi-Fi chip in the Retroid is just fine for streaming. Let's get the pros and cons out of the way. The blue metal gradient color is easily the best part of this device, and I hope this type of outside the box coloring catches on for others. The screen on the Retroid is great as well. The resolution and the size just make it a great way to play PSP and Game Boy Advance games, as well as others, and not having it feel compromised in any way. The D-pad is comfortable, it's loose, and it's really easy to just use. Lastly, the Retroid Android experience is well done, and hoping that more companies learn from them, like Ambernick. For cons, the sharp metal really is just unexplainable and unnecessary. The button placements are atrocious, and the size of the face buttons is just terrible. There's zero ergonomics or comfort to speak of with this slippery metal. And lastly, it seems like there was zero thought put into this at all, and just rushed out without making actual design changes to support a metal variant. There's obviously no question here, but the 405M is a better device through and through. If I had to choose between the two of them, it's an easy choice. It's going to be the 405M 10 out of 10 times. It feels like it was made by an actual company that thought through the negatives and pros of using a metal variant and decided to put things that might help users to make it easier for them. Obviously the big one that I was talking about earlier is the grips on the back, but there's nothing here on this device that can cut me, and it just feels perfect from an ergonomic standpoint and from a comfort standpoint. Nothing's going to fall out of my hands, and it just feels fantastic. I can't and won't recommend the Retroid Pocket 3 Plus Metal Edition to anybody, and I don't know if I would even go for the plastic version at this point, given that a lot of my issues were on the button placements and just the confusing layout of it. None of it made sense to me, and so it's just not the device for me personally. This puts me in a tough spot because this is a device that I visually love, but mechanically hate. And so as much as I'd love to just throw this on the shelf with the blue gradient showing on the back, I'm likely going to be throwing this device up for sale after this video, as I just don't have a need for it, and I really don't like it. The interesting part of all of this is that both companies seems to have the strength and weakness of the other. The Retroid's strength right now is the software, but that's Ambernick's weakness. 
And Ambernick's strengths is the buttons, the layouts, the design, and the build quality. And that's Retroid's weakness. I wouldn't want them to join in any way, shape, or form, but if either of them could look at the other and say, hey, maybe we should do that, maybe we might get some better devices in the future on both ends. We shouldn't have to rely on somebody to fix Ambernix software in their spare time and add support for things like L2 and R2 that should have been there from the beginning. Imagine if Ambernix was able to make a good Android build. They've had two years to fix the L2 and R2 issues and haven't done anything with that. And so that's why I'm saying both these companies could look at each other and take some inspiration for any future builds. I'm going to end it here. I hope this review was useful to you. If you liked today's video, check out my other video on the battle for the mini Game Boy status, which is the Miu Mini Plus and the Ambernic RG35XX. It's going to have a different feel than today's video, I promise. I liked both devices, so it's a lot happier in tone especially since it covers two of the best vertical devices on the market right now. Please don't forget to like and sub to help the channel grow and hope you all have a good one.